uh, seminar, uh, PLS Program Seminar Series. We have a uh, Conrad Curling. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Conrad, to welcome you. Uh, it's also an honor. It's a very impressive uh, CV and uh, achievement. Uh, so you did your PhD in physics uh, in Germany, and then uh, have a fellowship and postdoc position in UCL and then MIT and uh, uh, possibly other places. Uh, and then now uh, uh, your primary appointment is uh, at uh, UPenn. Uh, it's just incredible the uh, contribution you did in uh, like you know computation and neuroscience in general, uh, motor control. Uh, I've learned like you know that you work a lot on the rehabilitation. We have this course uh, which is called Repro Rehab. With uh, that, uh, I would definitely point that to you if uh, of interest. And uh, it's uh, also. Uh, to me, I mean, you know, it's a personal, like you know, uh, uh, honor because uh, uh, I've see, I've looked at uh, the Neuromatch Academy and Neuromatch Conference, uh, you know, uh, uh, incredible achievement uh, in terms of the uh, the number and the quality uh, of the uh, of what the Neuromatch has been doing. It's uh, it's just uh, incredible, and also seeing that you have uh, led this uh, publication platform as well. Uh, that you know, and I think that's that's one of the things that. One, uh, you know, the uh, kind of a, uh, you know, with the, the research uh, community really needs a new publication platform outside of the uh, traditional publishers. So I think that's uh, that's also an achievement that I'm, uh, I'm so impressed with. Um, yeah, so without further delay, Conrad, thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, I would just remind everyone that uh, you, you said you would be happy to be interrupted uh, during the talk. So, uh, uh, we look at the chat and uh, you know whenever you have a question uh, so yeah please uh, take it over thanks so, thanks so much again uh, what wonderful and I, I i would be delighted to get interrupted in fact let me switch to a better microphone okay this should i should sound a little bit better right now than than before apologies for that um let me jump right in oh my <gasps> help <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Oh, what's happening here? Ah, okay, hold on. I know what's happening here. Okay. Apologies Thank again. Thank you for time. That's okay. Uh, I'll figure it out. Uh, it shouldn't. Uh, uh, all all my knowledge of physics and engineering, and I can't like properly put the right slides on the on the screen. So today I'll be talking about machine learning for causality. I'm interested in very many different things. But uh, causality has been, for a couple of years, one of the main issues that I've been interested in. And so that's why I'm very, uh, very happy to be talking with you about it. So let me first try and do some intuition building. And I should say, I will be, uh, the next couple of slides are heavily influenced by Neuromatch Academy. Um, in fact, before I go into those slides, let me briefly plug Neuromatch Academy a little bit. Uh, Neuromatch Academy is this uh, way of learning computation, neuroscience, and also deep learning. They have two courses taken by a couple thousand people every summer. And the unique thing is that it's group-based. So it's always in small groups, 10, 15 people. We run in 14 time zones, 12 languages, something like that. And uh, people in those groups kind of learn the basics of uh, computational neuroscience and deep learning. And it's very much a community event. And um, so in that sense, uh, despite the introduction, I'm not really claiming any credit for myself there. Neomatch is a group of hundreds of volunteers that basically enables worldwide teaching of thousands of people, and I think it's a wonderful organization. So um, we all know correlation isn't causation. You all heard it many times, you know, like whenever someone teaches, like they all say, Correlation isn't causation. And we're all like, yes, correlation isn't causation. And then we think in our heads about like real world scenarios and kind of correlation is causation. Like at least when I think about stuff, you know, like I'm giving a talk here, it's just correlated with like me getting an email from the organizers. But in reality, like look realistically, the fact that I'm here talking with you is like very causally related to the organizers asking me. So um, all kinds of things seem like they're correlated, but they also seem like they're causal. And so we live in this world where we all have that deep intuition that 
correlation and causation are very similar. I mean, I don't know about you, but like I certainly strongly feel it where we feel like the two of them are very similar, but then we keep hearing that correlation and causation are different. And then people like Conrad give talks about like neuroscience being deeply in crisis because we want causal answers to questions in the real world, but we can't have them. Now, and let's, let's be clear what I mean when I talk about causation. I mean, um, when I say A causes B, I mean, if A hadn't happened, then B wouldn't have happened. Or like more to make it precise, um, I say A causes B, if, if we would have changed A to A star, then the probability distribution of B would have been different. But that's the standard like counterfactual definition, which is kind of like definition of causality is what would be the effect if we look at a system, reach and change something, does something change? That's what we mean with causation. So let's talk about the very simple system in which we can build intuition, which is this, it's, the, it's arguably the simplest dynamical system that has meaningfully defined causality. We have x t plus one, x is a vector, n-dimensional vector um, is sigma, which is just like a sigmoid nonlinearity. You can, in fact, take that out um, without changing much. Is sigma of, and then we have axt plus epsilon t. Now, epsilon t is noise. It's a noise vector, n-dimensional. The idea is like on every dimension, we have noise being added. And then we have axt, and a is arguably the causal matrix, you know, like how does each of the uh, variables that we have, each of the variables in our vector X, how does that affect each of the others at the next time step and itself? You know, so um, it's a, it's a simple, uh, it's a simple system. Now let's be clear about the dimensions. You now like A is an N by N matrix because it allows an influence of every dimension let's call them neurons here, you know, like n neurons, say thousand neurons or five neurons on everyone else. You know, like, and you can say the interpretation of that matrix is from which neuron to which neuron, you know, and therefore n by n matrix. And we assume that there's isotropic noise, there's no, like no structure to it, we initialize x0 to be zero. We also, in choosing A, we make it that the largest singular value of A is 0.99. Why are we doing that? Well, we don't want stuff that blows up and goes to, to infinity. We also don't want things where kind of like any effect is like immediately removed from it. So for this system to like meaningfully be a dynamical system, the largest singular value is going to be significantly bigger than zero because as it goes to zero, like the system loses all dynamical properties and smaller than one because then it becomes unstable. Okay, so in such a system is correlation causation. And let's be clear what we're expecting. Now, like you can say, if I have a strong connection from index I to index J in the matrix A, then I expect oftentimes when activity on dimension i, neuron i, is high at some time step to have the activity on neuron j to be large at the next time step. Okay, so we expect the delay of one correlation matrix to be an approximation to that causal generative matrix A that we have here. And then you can say, well, are they? No, and that's what I'll be doing over the next two slides. So let's look at a small system. No, like we have a small system here, six neurons generated exactly according to this process. No, and I hope you're all with me on that process. And on the top we have that, and and oh yeah, I, I forgot to say, I I I make the matrix be sparse. No, like like basically it's a binary matrix and it's just rescaled so that the largest singular value is 0.99. And uh, you see the matrix displayed in two ways at the top. In neuroscience, people often do that where they take 
a matrix like that and visualize it as a set of errors where you can say black error means like it's a connection that's there, white or invisible means it's a connection that's not there. You can then use grayscale or the width of the error to visualize the matrix. Alternatively, you can directly look at the matrix, which is what we do on the right hand side. But what you can see here is for this small system with six neurons, correlation and causation are very similar to one another. And that matches my intuitions in everyday life. Now, like, think about, like, five variables, six variables, what you say and what your friend says. And, like, sure, like, there's a causal relationship. If they're, like, mean to you, you'll be mean back to them. And like, it's a very simple set of relationships. And yes, correlation is causation. And like these kind of small systems, they're the kind of systems that easily fit into Conrad's head. And therefore, if I think about reality, that's kind of the scale at which I'm thinking. And if I simulate such systems, I almost always have that correlation is causation. Why? Because kind of I design these systems where like any input I put in, like it goes away relatively quickly. And um and like noise really plays a role there. Now, like what happens if we go from it being six dimensional to it being much bigger? Well, let's just try that. Same dynamical system, not like the only difference that we uh, that we do, same distribution or like same largest singular value. The only difference that we now do is that we make it so that the largest, uh, we, we make it that like we have hundred instead of six. And what you can see here on the left, again, true connectivity matrix, same generator. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have the estimated connectivity matrix, which is really just the time delay one correlation matrix rescaled. And look, those two, if I squint at it, they look very different. Whereas in this case, when I squint at it, I don't even need to squint at it. They look like very, very similar. So, and I'm not displaying that as like a set of, errors because, well, you couldn't see all those errors. But how come that they're so different? And let's look at it more broadly about it. If we change the number of neurons that we have, um, and as a function of that number of neurons, we measure the correlation, we can see how that correlation, oh, oh yeah, and the y, so the x-axis is like how many dimensions I simulate with this. The y-axis is the correlation between like the flattened matrix of of actual uh, values A and uh, the infra time delay one correlations. No? And as soon as long as the system is really small, think six, think three, they're very similar. As we get to very large numbers, they're very different. Why is this happening? Now, like as this is happening, basically noise from lots of neurons adds up on like the large singular values of the matrix. And therefore the system has kind of its own dynamics. And as we make it larger, the noise that we inject gets relatively weaker relative to the rest. And therefore correlation and causation get to be very, very different. Now you can say this is kind of treacherous because Conrad can think about n of three, but all this, as soon as a system is so big that Conrad can no longer meaningfully think about the system, what Conrad thinks about the system is no longer useful about the system. And that is like, of course, like a little frustrating. And out of this, in my view, comes that big confusion, which is that much of neuroscience and other parts of science as well, and we can talk about a lot of other domains, implicitly confuse correlation with causation. Like if you look at neuroscience, they call correlation matrices, they call them functional connectivity. Why do they call them functional connectivity? Because functional connectivity suggests connectivity, which should suggest causality. And if you then read in detail, the way the papers are written, it starts with the method section in which the word functional connectivity is exclusively statistically mathematically defined to a discussion section where connections are real and we worry about how we can use those connections to cure, cure the many diseases, brain diseases that humans suffer from. So, um, and this all comes from this confusion that correlation and causation like look very similar and in the small systems we're thinking of.
Okay, so now that we established that correlation and causation are different, let's talk about what we can do. Oh, hold on. Let me first get you like the, the quantitative intuition of what the effects are. This is an equation that is very commonly used in economics. Everyone studying economics gets to learn about this equation. This is an equation that in neuroscience and most branches of biology, no one has ever heard about. And yet it's beautiful, simple, and easy to understand. We have a system where we have activities YI, and those, y, uh, those YI are affected by two sets of variables, a set of variables that we do measure, the XIs, uh, we have then yi is xi beta. No, beta are then the causal influences of the variables x on the variable that I measure y. And a set of variables zi that have causal influence delta on the variable that I'm interested in on yi. And then there's noise. And for some reason, they call noise not epsilon by u, but like be my guest. Every field has their own ways of doing things. Okay, now we can. As always, we do linear regression. Like if you do nonlinear things, the same principles hold. It's just harder to understand. So uh, what we do is we calculate the, the, the regression coefficients. So we have beta hat, the my, my estimates of them. And this is like, uh, and we'll be doing the estimates in the limit of infinite data because we're interested in biases. Okay, so my estimate of beta is going to be x prime x to the minus one, which is basically the covariance matrix between the variables x that I do observe and the inverse of that times x uh, times x prime. And then we have like y and y is, is x beta plus z, z delta plus u. Then we can put that into, uh, the, the, then we can basically reformulate that equation. So then we have that the expected value of beta hat given x is beta, which is good, which are the real causal effects that we have. Plus, then there's the second term, which are the effects of the variables that we didn't observe. And we basically, what we have here is we have that same inverse covariance matrix. And then we have the expected value of x prime z, give condition on x, which doesn't do much here. Um, so what we have there is basically, now if you look at that, it has the same format as what we have with the x. Now, if we think about neuroscience, how many x do we record from? Well, maybe 10,000 if we're very lucky. That's like state of the art in most areas. We can record more in some cases using optical techniques, but then our signal to noise gets much worse and our temporal resolution gets much worse. So like, like they're in that range. How many variables are there? Well, if you talk about a human, about 85 billion variables if we think about individual neurons. So we have order 1,000 variables, order 10 to the 3 variables that are in the X. We have like order 10 to the 10 variables that are in the Z. So therefore, we have far more variables that add at um, that, that basically add bias. Keep in mind that right hand term is not something that goes away with more data. When I tell that to neuroscientists, they often tell me like, well, like how much more data do we need? Well, no, this bias stays in the limit of infinite data. So there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And that's not, it's not the case that like some nonlinear technique magic he gets at, at, out of this problem. This is a fundamental confounding. Now it can be used in a positive way as well, where you could say, well, imagine you have a small system. There's a small number of variables. Let's say smoking. Does smoking cause, cause cancer or lung cancer? Well, um, it turns out that in that case, people have long argued or had long argued. Well, what if like smokers are like risk takers and risk takers, they die of random other things or they get more cancer for some reason? Well, you can say, well, yes, they are more risk takers, but the effect is only 10%. The correlation is only 10%, and therefore, because the x prime z is only 10%, like all together, this should have a very, very weak effect. And so we can use the omitted variable bias equation both to get a notion of how strongly will we be confounded by if we take correlations and treat them as if there were causality, but also like under which circumstances do we think that the confounding is relatively small? When do we expect that correlation and causation will actually be very similar? Okay, so, and I should just say, like, correlations between neurons are, aren't very small. I should add one more thing. Hold on. No, I, okay. Um, uh, how many, so, so, JB Pauline asked how many, how would the partial correlations look like on these? 
And that must have been a question about the fast and the partial correlation. So partial correlation for these things, if you correct for all of them, look very good. Why? Because it's a way of correcting for things. If we have a nonlinearity and the nonlinearity is not well modeled, then the partial correlations look bad. And there's a nice recent paper by Ila Fiet that quantifies what that problem is. So if you have a nonlinear system, you need to get things right. But it does, for that to be a useful technique, you need to record from all the neurons at the same time. I should mention, this is a great question. And if you go to the neural match tutorials on, uh, on network causality, you will find exactly that case of partial correlations and using them be covered there. Um, I should also mention there's a there's a power issue as well, which is even if we would record from all neurons in the brain, we couldn't estimate what the uh, what the what the partial correlations are for various computational reasons. And I'd be happy to talk about it later in the question. Thanks for the question. I didn't know that I could open the chat from my persp uh, from my perspective. So thanks, thanks so much. And I love these questions. So like, please interrupt me anytime. Um, so. Um, now, let's talk about why do people doing machine learning want causality? Um, the first answer I should already say is all real questions are causal. Now, like if you do machine learning, take MNIST, detect uh, numbers. The only reason why we want to detect the numbers originally is because we wanted to deliver the post to the right houses, which is a causal thing. Now, like I want to choose an action that makes the world be better for me. So all real questions in the world are ultimately causal, but there are regular prediction questions that appear as part of the causal problem, which is detecting where to bring our the post office's uh, letters to makes people happy and ultimately increases the revenue of uh, the U.S. postal service. And therefore, recognizing the numbers is good. But like from a pure machine learning perspective, why do we want causality? The, the main issue is it promises to allow us to generalize better. If we understand how the world actually works, then we can better choose which actions are good. And the reason why we can't do that in a predictive way or just reinforcement learning is the future is different. And because the future is different, uh, the things that work now in our current distribution will not work in the future. And also, of course, it promises to allow us to learn faster, communicate better, understand humans, because humans think about their world in terms of causality, support counterfactual reasoning. So there's a lot of interest in machine learning uh, on the issue of causality. I should also say for people interested in the field between causality and machine learning, there's a wonderful conference clear that happens every year that uh, that uh, I, I think is very interesting for people in that, that field. So let's talk about cases where we can learn about causality. And I should say, for me personally, there, uh, there's the, the cases where we can understand causality in the world are relatively rare. There's the cases where we understand causality because we basically push the button. Think about lights in a house. And like kids go in, switch the house. You can find out about causality by like randomly running experiments yourself. You can run, someone else can have run experiments and they explain it to you. So we get it from human language. And then sometimes the world randomizes things for you. And I will be talking about instrumental variables here, but there's this whole class of, methods, they're called quasi-experimental techniques in, so in the social sciences that are about how can we sometimes exploit if the world randomizes things for us. So here's the idea of an instrumental variable. We have an, a so-called instrument, we, uh, instrumental variable um, that randomly chooses treatment. Let's say I have a I had a toddler at some point of time and she would switch light switches randomly. So uh, if we assume she's random, then she introduces a random treatment on the light switch. And I observe then whatever she randomly pushes it up, the light turns on. So outcome would be the light and uh, X would be what she does to that light switch. And sometimes she turns it off and then the light turns off. And so, if we have a, a true instrumental variable, then we have an instrument that affects the treatment. That instrument only 
influences the world through that treatment. So that's the so-called exclusion restriction. Um, now, we might have confounders in the world, maybe like certain lights only work during the day, certain lights only work during the night, all kinds of things. But importantly, the assumption of instrumental variables is that the instrumental variable will never directly influence, uh, it will never be directly influenced by confounders, and that it only affects the X and the Y, and that the instrument only affects the world through the treatment. Okay, so, so this is one of the key cases where we can learn something about the world. Now, why? Let's, let's get the intuition for that. The instrument basically randomly switches the treatment. It's as if someone else runs a randomized control trial, and I can observe what the effect is. And somehow, magically, I've been told that the instrument only affects the treatment. And this is the, the, the way how this methods work, method works or doesn't work. If there's any risk that the confounder influences the instrument, then we can't do anything. Um, and if the instrument somehow affects the confounders, then also we can't do anything about it. But if the instrument only has its effect through the treatment, then we're good. And like, think about medicine. Now you can say, um, if I get randomly assigned a doctor, the doctor chooses what my treatment is, then I might be in a good situation because the doctor is not affected maybe by my, uh, by my, my socioeconomic status. Of course, in reality, they of course are, and there's big problems with instrumental variable studies in medicine, despite the fact that they're becoming more popular at the moment. Okay, now, if the exclusion restriction is correct and we're confounded, now let's say the confounder is relevant, the confounder affects the treatment, the, founder, uh, the confounder affects the outcome. What I can do is I can now do just linear regression and I can use the instrumental variable assumption. Now, if the instrumental variable assumption is correct, then they're going to get an unbiased estimate. That unbiased estimate is going to have, be a higher variance. So all those techniques, quasi-experimental causality, add noise to our estimates, increase the variance of our estimates, but they remove bias. And the bias is what we're worried about because the noise we can get down by like just running more experiments, the bias we kind of can't get rid of at all. And here we have a regression estimate, heavily biased, low variance, and a correct instrumental variable thing, more variance, but unbiased. And um, and that's why people are interested in like running it in the context of medicine. Now, if it's violated, if basically that exclusion restriction is wrong, let's say uh, we talk about the doctor, the doctor turns out chooses your treatment, but the doctor also like has a direct influence on your outcome, maybe by treating other underlying diseases that you have, then we'll be in that situation where not only do we have more variants, but we also are biased, potentially biased more than we'd be otherwise. And I should say for people interested in instrumental variable, Tony Leo has like a very nice tutorial paper on that. And for people who have a camera, uh, here is here is how you can get to those tutorials. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a fun thing to put in QR talks and uh, QR codes into talks. Um, and it's a, it's a new thing that I didn't used to be doing. In any case, I hope everyone who wanted a photograph get a photograph of this. Um, let's talk about a concrete case. Uh, we might be asking, does eating grain? make ducks, uh, allow ducks to have, to lay more eggs. Um, treatment T is eating eggs, uh, outcome is more eggs. And um, now you can say uh, we might be confounded. Now, like maybe heavy uh, ducks um, uh, like grains more and heavy ducks uh, lay, more uh, lay more eggs. So then we'd have a confounder. Um, now, for an instrumental variable, we would want to have something that makes a random thing, like uh, assigns them to treatments, and uh, then the confounder is no longer a problem for us. Now, so, and the reason why the instrumental variables work is a heavy duck is as likely to be randomly assigned to the grain situation versus the non-grain situation. And therefore, ultimately, the confounding no longer matters, despite the fact that it's still there confounding things. So a big problem, however, in that field 
is non-compliance. There's people who will basically, if the doctor tells them take this drug, they do take it. And then there's other drugs, uh, other people who are basically, well, no, I won't do that. And it could be confounded itself. So now you can say we could have never taken us. And uh, hold on, like brief zoom out. I'm sorry, I didn't give a good introduction here. It's a, it's a, it's a new slide deck that I don't have so much experience with. What we're what, what we'll be doing now is we're going to look at a new problem that occurs in the context of instrumental variables and provide a new solution to that, namely to the problem of non-compliance. And you'll see why it matters a great deal. Imagine we have some ducks that are basically like, look, I'm not eating grains. Like you can offer me anything, I'll rather stuff, but I'm not going to be eating grains. Then there could be always takers. These, these, Ducks will always only eat grains, and you can offer them anything else. They will. They, there's just absolutely no interest. And then there's the compliance, kind of like, uh, like, uh, like ducks that will basically do as you tell them to. And now, you can say in the presence of these two groups, there's a big problem, which is if I have the non-compliers in my group. I will, they will add a lot of noise to my data. Like, like they, they will effectively be from the wrong group. And because they're from the wrong group, anything that I learn about them will basically be misleading to me. Okay, so uh, this is what we have there. On the x-axis, we have how many units we excluded. And in this case, it's like four units that basically are non, uh, three units, that, uh, four units that are non-complying. And on the on the y-axis, we have the estimated power. And so now what do you see? You see that the estimated power goes up as we start throwing away units. Let's get an intuition for why it goes up. Now, like if we have non-compliers in our group that don't they don't do what they should be doing, if you could as an oracle tell me, well, they're non-compliers. I could throw them away and therefore they would add less noise to my data. And because I'd have less noise, I would be able to see the effects that are real better because like we simply have less noise in here. So therefore you can say, what's the variance of the IV estimator? Well, it's the variance of Y uh, given Z and, and, and things being compliant divided by N. And now, then we have this P comply thing. If P comply is one, everyone is a complier, I get a high power estimate. The more people I have that are non-compliant, imagine what if 90% of people are non-compliant, then we will get very bad results because they basically we're dominated by noise of, of like units that will never do anything. Now, here's where it gets to be interesting. Now you can say, well, like for ducks, they would mostly be compliers. Well, if we talk about medicine, in medicine, compliers are surprisingly hard to find. So the vast majority of, of doctor, doctor patient pairs will just be non-compliant with what, whatever guideline you give them, uh, which sounds shocking, but like, welcome to the medical system. Um, so let's go. So here we have, uh, we have the, the ducks. 10 ducks, four, four non-compliers, six compliers. If we throw away the four, non-compliance, we're going to get the best results. So what, we, what, we, what we're going to have is that the effective number that we have is the real number that we have times the square of the compliance. And by, by throwing out the compliance, we're able to make this be one at zero cost for us. So very helpful. Um, no, you can say, can we do that in a data-driven way? We can say, what if we can use observed features and machine learning to predict who's a complier. And then we will only look at those that are compliers. That's an obvious strategy. Basically look at things, uh, at features that we have, and we use that to predict if someone will be a complier, and then we throw away all the non-compliers. So here's the idea, data-driven exclusion. We have on the x-axis, which proportion are compliance. You have the estimated power. Keep in mind that most studies in the world in almost all disciplines are very heavily underpowered. So using this can help. In fact, in lots of cases, we can have a far larger number of effective 
subjects than we really have. Now let's try that on some real data. We take Optum data. That's a big, big data set from insurers. Regression discontinuity setting. Uh, in principle, if your A1C, which is a measure on your hemoglobin that kind of tells you how high your blood, blood sugar normally is, if it's 6.5 uh, or higher, you should be called diabetic. Uh, it's somewhat fuzzy. And uh, if your doctor calls you diabetic, then uh, in the future, you should be better. And the kind of causal question that we want to ask is, is being identified as diabetic going to make you live more healthily in the sense that your A1C actually goes down? And um, here's what we did. We take on the x-axis here, we have the A1C. In principle, everyone who's above 6.5 should be called diabetic. Everyone who's below it should not be called diabetic. Now look at like the diabetes uh, diagnosis ratio. It kind of jumps from 0.25 to like 0.35. What does that mean about compliance? It means that 90% are non-compliant here. Very typical in those settings. You know, like people have should be called diabetic they're not called diabetic these people should not be called diabetic they're called diabetic so massive amounts of non-compliance there now you can say if we use uh, data-driven exclusion we throw away items where we think these people these doctor patient pairs will not listen to it we can make this if uh, this effect size here be considerably larger no, like we are much more statistically powered. And if we do it, we get better powered estimates there. The reason why it matters is this kind of something we can use for all instrumental variable studies across medicine. And I want to briefly talk about the logic here. Now, it's a very non-standard logic. Machine learning tells us whom we are talking about. It's basically, look, 80% of people that are not compliant, you cannot say anything about them because you will be throwing them away. You will only be talking about those 20% and you have a machine learning oracle who says who you're talking about. And then you have a, a, an IV scenario who like gives you an estimate of how what the effect for that is, which is a weird non-standard logic. It kind of just says, who are we allowed to be talking about? But by choosing who you're talking about, you can be much better powered. We can then say nothing about the expected non-compliers, but we can say things with high certainty about the expected compliers. And we're currently working for a dragnet approach of that, where we can basically go through all health data, find all the opportunities to do instrumental variables or regression discontinuity studies, find where those thresholds are and find under which definitions of who's in and who's not, we can get the strongest power. And we're currently working on that. Um, wonderful. I have six more minutes here. Um, and I'll be talking about something completely different, which is learning causal discovery no like how how do we usually how do we usually solve causal inference or like for that matter any statistical problem we go to a statistician we're like okay this is what i believe to be true about the world how should i be analyzing my data and the, and the statistician will be like yeah let me think about it like iid has the assumptions that we have here's like a statistical procedure but now Here's a radical alternative. What if we instead let the data give us that strategy? And that's a paper with Xin Yu Wang. Um, in supervised learning that we do in machine learning, no, we know which inputs are right. Uh, we know what the inputs are and we know ground truth outputs. And we get good at mapping the inputs to outputs. Now, the same thing we can do for causal inference. Now, if you give me ground truth of what the causal effect of something is, and you do that often enough, I can learn my statistical causal inference procedure from that. That procedure might be much more complicated than what statisticians usually do. And now, where do causal inference algorithms come from? Like, we have those statisticians, human knowledge, human insight. It goes into it, makes an algorithm. We take the data, it gives us that, uh, it, and it gives us causal estimates. Does this inf variable influence that other variable? But no, you could say we could do the same thing as we do in supervised learning. We give, you give me data, and you also give me ground truth causality. What actually happens? Think in medicine. 
we have lots of observational data and we have the RCT think about uh, in the real world, uh, we like do perturbations for our system. And like companies use causal inference all the time to like, um, we have places where we have ads where you like randomly give some people an ad, other people don't get uh, get the ad. We see what the effect is. So we have a lot of causal ground truth data in the world, and we can say take the data, we take ground truth causality, and we predict one from the other, and then we have a test data set to see. Uh, uh, how good we're doing and then ultimately we have a new data set and we use that to solve our causal inference problem so in other words we replace our statistician our causal inference person with just like lots and lots of data where we know what truth is and we needed something to test it on and here's a simple dynamical system where causality is defined which is the MOS 6502 I previously applied neuroscience to it to see what neuroscientists would learn for it it's a fun paper that some of you might enjoy reading um but the important thing is we go in and we can know what causality is. We go in basically with a wire and put in some extra current and then we see what happens everywhere else. It's all simulated so we don't actually need to put in wires because that would be a skill that I'm not so good at. So here's the causal prompt. I give you two, two places in the microprocessor and I ask you, does the first causally influence the other? No, it's two transistors can simulate it, I can figure out if it does. And here we have two cases. We have a causal pair, two things where the first one actually influences the second one, and a second one where the first one does not actually influence one. Like those are ground truth cases where we have ground truth causality. And now the question is, I give you the traces of both of them, and I ask you to guess, is it causal or is it not causal? And the hope is by giving enough data for that, we can discover features that tell you that it is. Now, like, and intuitively, we can think about it. Now, you can say if one of them causally influences the other, then the, the voltage going up on one and should like immediately increase the current on the other, which should like change the way how the voltage changes on the other. And we can kind of like think about it like that. But in reality, it's very complicated. There's things like the clock overall on it, and it's very difficult for us to think through it. But maybe an algorithm can figure out something good. And uh, to be clear, how do we get it? Causality, well, we define it about the causal effect of like adding some extra current. Here you see average effect of lesioning. We can have average treatment effect and we can have like different uh, transistors and we can like, of course, have different causal effects. And we do an honest validation. We divide all transistors into two halves, non-overlapping halves. We use one half to train a causality detector, train a causal strategy to get at causality. And we use the second half of transistors to figure out if we get it right. Um, and then what should we be using for that statistics? Well, it kind of doesn't deep, doesn't matter, but hey, it's 2023. So we obviously use a, a use like a meaningful transformer because they kind of look a trans a, a transformer is just all the tricks that have been working in deep learning uh, packaged into one system. So like it's probably going to do good and it does good. So what we have here is we have a few methods that human statisticians came up with. And, you know, maybe correlation, maybe mutual information, maybe Granger causality. Like we worked through a whole bunch of these techniques. And then we have the alternative techniques. Well, we use like modern systems, transformers, or we tried others, but there's really not much difference. Important insight here, it works really great. And things like Granger causality work really not so great. Why should we be expecting that? Well, because it's a heavily confounded system. And um, a meta land cause or land causal inference procedure will basically come up with ways of like minimizing the effects of confounding. Whereas like human made methods don't understand confounding because you can't go to a statistician and say, say like, yeah, here's our system, but like, look, here's the things that like, probably there's like a global clock signal that's going to mess up everything. And they'll be like, yeah, well then come back to me once you can make that go away. So, uh, so, 
so this is basically stats in a really dirty world in which we can't really understand things as humans. And then you can say, well, does it work with noise? Like, yes, these methods are very, very noise tolerant. We can add an awful lot of noise. Basically, mutual information goes back to chance as soon as you add like significant levels of noise. And then you can say, well, does it generalize? Yes, it generalizes very well. You can train on space invaders and test on pitfalls. Works great. No problem. Like, uh, no problem there. And you can also, we can use things like GradCam to ask which pieces of the data does it actually use. And it uses the ones that a human would be using. It focuses on like things where it transitions from one voltage to the other and basically like implicitly looks at like, do they do it at the same time? Do they do it differently? How strongly are they correlated and things like that? Um, what does that mean? Uh, what's the disadvantages of this approach? No, it requires a lot of ground truth data. It's impossible for humans to understand. You look at like these techniques that we train like this, and it means absolutely nothing. Uh, and they're also biased. You know, like they will very happily use any part of the logic that we can use to make a good prediction. But um, if we have enough ground truth data, this way of solving causal inference will be better than anything you're going to get out of humans. Why? Because it deals with all the aspects that us humans can't understand. In a way, it's like a deeply humble way of dealing with uh, statistical problems. It kind of says the data has lots of aspects that we don't understand, and therefore, let's just use the things that work in other similar cases. You can also get meaningful proofs for that, where you can say, as long as I sample my causal inference cases out of a universe of causal inference cases that are similar, I'm going to be able to have proofs for that. And uh, we can get into messy observational spaces. We can also get into places that are just not very amenable to analytical treatments, you know, like small n. Normally in stats, you always need corrections for that. But like, yeah, like this thing will like naturally come up with the right corrections for that. Take home message of my overall talk is um, real world questions tend to be about causality. Causality and machine learning have really have overlapping problems. And I think there's interesting applications for machine learning in causal inference and interesting applications of causal inference in machine learning. Um, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of different fields that barely ever talk with one another. And I think like a machine learning people can learn a lot by learning about causal inference and causal inference people can also learn an awful lot about learning about machine learning because we are in uh, uh, most data sets we're dealing with in particular as they get bigger and bigger are dirty we rarely have like clean experimental non-confounded data sets ever and um, check out the clear conference and i think also like specifically to the pieces here i think uh, exclusion criteria is something that we should be thinking about uh, machine learning solutions to now, like most most trials most most experiments have defined ex inclusion exclusion criteria we should be using data to tell us how to do that at the moment it's like really inefficient and maybe we should look at like more very large data driven ways of thinking about causal inference and with this uh, thanks so much for listening to me talking about causality Thanks uh, so much, Conrad. That was a beautiful talk. Uh, I'm uh, guessing, uh, yes, we have already some questions. Zeta, do you want to? Uh, Hi, ask? how are you, Conrad? Good to hey, see dear. you. I'm so glad to see you. Um, sorry, so for those who don't know, I, I know Conrad from my master's degree at Northwestern. He's an incredible research investigator, and it's so nice to see him again. Um, I just wanted to see if you could talk again or highlight the effect size um, figures you were talking about, what you what you think is the significance of analyzing effect sizes for instrumentational for instrumental, excuse me, variables. Can you go back to that slide and? Uh, sure. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm no longer sharing my screen. Let me put that back on. Uh, uh what about this here? Uh, you wanted to go to yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. So. I, I don't think people, I, I'm I'm encountering that with my data now. I don't think people understand the significance of effect sizes fully other than understanding it as a threshold for whether or not your data 
is significant enough to publish or if you have enough data points to have a robust effect size. So I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. The, the data like immediately homes in uh, on the place where it hurts. And I appreciate that. So um, so first, let's briefly talk about effect sizes. Now, like, like what we usually define as effect size, uh, it, it, like Cohen's D, uh, D is we look at the size of an effect that we have divided by the standard deviation. It's a very nat a standard uh, standard error. It's a very nat uh, no, uh, no by the standard deviation. Now, what we have here is standard errors. Now, significance relates to the ratio of this difference between. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, yeah. So so so. Significance is related to the effects, the, the, the means, the, the difference that we have between here and here, divided by the standard error. But but in reality, what we care about, like for effect sizes for the things that are medically relevant, is like usually in terms of what the standard deviation is. Um, why uh, kind of you can say if I move you like one standard deviation in the population to a better place, it's probably like meaningful. Um, it, and it doesn't depend on the number of subjects that we have here. Now, let's let's look at these two graphs up there. We have an effect on being diagnosed. What we have up there uh, down there is the effect of being on the other side uh, side of it based on follow-up A1C. So this is the outcome that I'm interested in. This is just a trick that I use to estimate something. Now you can say here, is it significant? Yes. Is this more significant? Yes. How much more significant is it? Well, like we are bringing that down to roughly the same main effect. And now we have here a point 17 and here we have a point 13 what's going on here like the technique isn't all that useful and the reason why that technique here isn't all that useful is because in that specific data set it's very difficult to estimate who will be compliant uh, that depends on like how much you know about the people uh, but that also uh, I mean, diabetes is just like, look, like the, the people are usually old. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of comorbidities and there's all kinds of reasons why we want to be careful about it. So it's a it's a technique that is logically very clean, but it's a technique. Now, uh, let, let, me, let me give the other side. Now, like if we have an, an effective size that's like 20% larger or something, it means that you will need like order 40 percent less subjects or something so for the practical aspects of like learning things about populations in reality this may be very relevant but it's not something that kind of moves something that looks like really crappy like this into the domain where it like moves really cleanly and now you mm -hmm. can say the other thing that you said uh, that you said is effect sizes you know like what's the effect size here if i call you diabetic that, which is the difference between what we have on the two sides. The follow-up A1C like jumps down from 6.7 to 6.3, which is a pretty small effect. And like this is not gonna, even if we could move all those folks over to the other side, uh, it wouldn't like massively increase longevity. Why basically people are like very, very badly diabetic. They, they kind of all are on drugs because like, basically they die otherwise people who like really don't need to be <laughs> treated they they like yeah like i'm not taking diabetes medicine because like no one would dream in their father's dreams to do something like that but uh, but like yes it it makes a difference but it's a relatively small methodological difference now to be clear if you if you replace this method where we like basically use as instrument if you're called diabetic or not with like with 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 just ordinarily squares you're going to get very very biased very very different results where it's if, if anything like i think the effect blip signs and it's actually uh, it, it's it's actually good to be not correctly diagnosed with diabetes but yeah wonderful question or what can i say and thanks for the answer 
You also have two new questions in the chat. Uh, one is the what the percentage of people don't follow the uh, doctor's orders. That's uh, I guess that may depend on the context. But also a question from Celia on uh, keeping or removing non-compliers is related to efficiency versus effectiveness in epidemiology. I really public health needs to work with the later what your thoughts, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so let me first answer Luca's question, which proportion of people don't follow the doctor's orders? Um, that depends on the situation. And what we have here is that the doctors don't follow the doctor's order in about 70% of the time. Um, in the in the case of uh, so so we we have some decent data for that because it turns out that your insurer both knows what's been prescribed to you but they also know if you went to the pharmacy to pick up your drugs so out of that we know that like depending on the disease for some cases compliance is very very good like patients with parkinson's really take their drugs. I mean, like, it's amazing. Like, they all take their drugs because not having them is really very bad. And then for 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 drugs like diabetes, drugs at the margin, like, compliance can be very low. Uh, I believe schizophrenia drug compliance is very low, despite the effects being very positive. Um, so, uh, yes compliance across all of medicine and like there must be meta-analysis of that but i'll be surprised if it's like larger than 50 percent i will be not surprised if it's less than 20 um i mean like i have a couple of prescriptions myself for like minor aches i'm 50 by now um i'm like super heavily non-compliant on that stuff and i'll be surprised <laughs> if the rest of the world is much better with it so let's go to celia greenwood's question keeping or removing compliance uh, compliance is related to efficacy versus effectiveness in epidemiology absolutely yes arguably public health needs to work with the latter um yes no like i i 100 agree great 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 point no like but but let's make the point for like techniques like this. So, so there's two aspects of what I talked about that are important. Like the first one is if you want the transition towards away from pure correlational methods to quasi experimental methods. This is like super important because it makes it more likely that what we do actually means like anything. And in most domains in epidemiology, we're just like heavily confounded. Now, like socioeconomic status, your character, all kinds of things very heavily confound everything. So that's the first thing. Um, the other one is what do we get by doing like games like uh, like, like non-complier rejection? And indeed, all we get is we basically get to have less noise in our data. And like that's the only thing that we get for it. And um, why is it valuable? Well, it kind of means that at the margin we can we can like it's like we have a slightly better microscope. We can see effects that are smaller. Now, there's the other piece of under which circumstances do I want to look for an effect? Now, you can say an effect size that is so small that basically the the minute it takes you to take the drug every day takes more time out of your life than the drug puts into your life like that's like i actually care about like the effect size of something being large and this is something that we don't do anything about no like it could be that we have we're statistically weak and the effect size is very small uh or the you know it could be that statistically it's very hard to see the effect but it really makes a massive big difference on the people and then there's cases where like basically uh, it doesn't even matter no like it kind of like yeah the effect size is tiny we have like a very very large n so we get significance and it's still use useless um Wonderful. Let me go to Curie's question. I think I missed something. Was the goal to classify whether a patient is diabetic or not diabetic? No. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I gave the talk last time for a more, more stats-oriented audience. What we do with instrumental variables is we want to know one thing, which is how does being diagnosed 
diabetic, how does that affect your outcome? Because if it makes your life better, then we should basically get more people identified as diabetics and vice versa. So that's what we're interested in. We really want to just have the influence, uh, know how does the treatment affect the outcome. Now, what we use is we use this funky like two stage approach where we take basically the randomization here is are you like at just below the threshold or just above the threshold? And we use that as a trick to find out if being called a diabetic, how that affects your life. So in instrumental variables, we use that randomization by the world, which is like, it's really random if you if, if, if you, they measured 6.51 or 6.49. Now for all practical purposes, that's random. And we use that randomness as a trick to find out what the effect of treatment is. I'm just using diabetic because it's like a, a popular thing, like, um, and if so, wouldn't you want to evaluate more than just the A1C values? Yeah, so A1C values as an outcome measure is basically, does the treatment help you like live more healthily? It's kind of just one of the low, low hanging, like lots of data that's there. This wasn't a particular good question. Now, Kiri, I, I, I get what you're saying. Now, like the fact that being treated for diabetes makes your mean diabetes outcome measure, namely the blood sugar, like be better, like duh. Conrad, like wonderful. You're telling us something that's super trivial, but we're working on that trivial thing to make sure that the logic of our approach generally works. I wouldn't want to go like to like medical reality until we basically figured out that we can be helpful for like very standard things like does treatment with the drugs, does being diagnosed as a diabetic actually make your blood sugar go down? Great question. If there's no other question. Yeah, you know, there's yes, another question. There's another question. Yeah, in, in your second to last slide, you're saying that how um the in, in the cons it's not um understand the, uh, the like features you, you can't identify which features are important because this is a black box. So how would you approach that to understand like well what are the cons features if we're just like, interested in? Yeah, so so the the explainable machine learning explainable AI question is like one of the big questions of our time. Um, here's where I come out on that. I think explainable AI is fundamentally impossible. And 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 I mean, like, l l let me be fair to the question. You can say, I can always like solve a machine learning problem, and I can always find a simple subprom that gets a sum of the way. Now, unfortunately, for most real world problems, and I, I go so far and say almost all real world problems, um, that can't be uh, can't be possible. And the reason for that is take something that's interesting. You know, like, are you are, are you a diabetic or uh, will you be compliant? For most of these problems, there's not like a simple solution. Or, oh, you'll be compliant if you have that doctor. No, like that doctor sometimes compliant, sometimes not compliant. But instead, what we have is we have a long, 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 heavy tail of things that are all like just weakly indicative. And I, I argue that that's the feature of almost all machine learning problems where you can say there's some variables that are large and important and I can tell you about it. But in reality, there is a very non-negligible -neg piece of what makes good machine learning systems really good that kind of uses all these other very, very weak features. And in that domain, we can't explain to you how the algorithm works because there's basically that long, heavy tail of things that are just like very weakly indicative about things. And I should say there's some nice both theoretical and empirical work of my colleague here, Prate, Pratik Chautari, who quantifies this effect. And for a lot of machine learning problems, there's just this heavy, heavy tail of things that are like, every single feature is like very weakly indicative. You know, like are blue, blue haired people like, are they more likely to have diabetes? Like that sounds bullshit, but like in reality, uh, the blue hair is like a weak indicator of them kind of like probably being energetic in a way, which is like a weak indicator of them like properly talking with the doctor and therefore probably a weak indicator of them not being diabetic or something. So basically, um, 
we have this long, 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 long tail of like weak things. And now this is kind of, I think where the domains where we do machine learning and the domains where humans excel are fundamentally different. We as humans have built a world around us where causality is super powerful. Like most things only do one thing. The light switch doesn't like make the blender go off. It only makes the light go off. So we, we live in a world that is both designed and self-selected so that causality is the super sparse thing that everything influences only a very, very small number of things. In such a world, explainability is super powerful. So if, if, if what do you know, like someone like is annoyed about me, I can meaningfully argue, was I mean to them? No, was I mean to their best friend? Yes here is kind of why like they might feel bad about me like we have like this super powerful way of arguing causally as humans that is really great in the niche that we built for ourselves but when we go into these spaces where machine learning is powerful think object recognition think uh think uh just think chess playing think kind of like think medicine in all those places kind of like this notion of explainability fails to work. It only works in the part of the world that we built so that we can do those things. So I'm just going to follow up because I'm working in what I'm interested in cause and effect as well. Um, and I'm interested in the using a counterfactual approach. I mean, you briefly mentioned the reading a lot right on it. So what are your opinions on counterfactual approach? Hey, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Could someone relate uh, relate the question to me close to the microphone? I didn't I didn't acoustically get it. Yeah, yeah. Come up a little bit lower. Speak up. Speak yeah, your outside voice. Um, yes. So uh, you you briefly mentioned counterfactual inference, but didn't elaborate on it, and that's something I'm kind of interested in. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts on it? Is that an approach that we consider, or, or why? why not? Uh, hold on. Which, which approach is an approach I would? Tell your thoughts on counterfactual and inference. No, because it's going to make. Well, right. I think the question was, what are your thoughts on counterfactual inference? So counterfactual reasoning is something that humans absolutely do. It is something that is very vulnerable to covariate drift, though. No, like so, you can say. Um, if if I know the true causal nature of the world, then causal inference is uh, and and counterfactual reasoning is the only way of properly working. Now, like you can say, planning in causal space is counterfactual reasoning. So, count, counterfactual reasoning is clearly the right solution in the space in the niche that us humans work in. Now, you can say. How good are we with machine learning and counterfactual reasoning? We're very, very bad at the moment. If you want, like, ChatGPT can't solve counterfactual reasoning, like, outside of very, very trivial problems. And humans are, like, just absolutely amazing at that. Should it be a goal in intelligence research to build systems that are better at counterfactual reasoning? Absolutely. Do I think we have good ways of doing that at the moment? Absolutely not. Do I think medicine is suffering from a lack of good counterfactual reasoning? Like, absolutely. Do I know how to solve it? Like, maybe not at this point of time. Like, uh, but, but yes, it's a great, great, great question. Thanks again. I think we we have run out of time. Uh, it was really truly a pleasure to uh, have you, Conrad. Uh, I, I'm very glad that you are not diabetic, uh, and uh, and I hope yeah, to meet uh, meet with you, and we all hope to meet with you uh, at the conferences or in the future uh, talks. One, one, wonderful. I, I I come relatively regularly to Montreal, so Excellent. great to see you. Yes.